The windmill on Wimbledon Common has stood here for over 200 years, but in that time its use and appearance have changed several times. It was built in 1817 by a Roehampton carpenter, Charles March, to grind locally grown wheat into flour. It's an unusual design and is believed to have been copied from a mill that stood in Southwark, near the Globe Theatre at that time. Uh, when the windmill was first built in 1817, as you can see from the construction, it was brick only on the ground floor and then timber on the first floor and for the tower. The diorama shows the way people worked building it and the tools that they used. In 1976, when the mill was being restored, Mr. Bert Follen, a millwright who lived locally, been born in Norfolk, and uh, he helped with us. These tools are part of his collection. He retired and he gave them all to us. Unfortunately, it's an excellent collection which he's provided and we have it on permanent display in our the cap of the mill carrying the sails was supported on a large timber post which allowed the cap to be rotated so that the sails always faced into the wind. The post had to be hollow to allow an iron shaft to pass through it into the building below, providing power for the milling machinery. This is why it was known as a hollow post mill. Sacks of wheat were hoisted up onto the first floor where there were two millstones and the wheat was poured into the wooden hoppers over the stones. In the early days, when grain had to be ground to make flour, they did it in a simple way, like this. It's called a saddle stone. They also used a pestle and mortar, which is a, a stone bowl, and you hammer away at the grain to crush. Now, this particular one is about 5,000 years old. The best way of grinding wheat into flour was to use a quern. This is two stones, one on top of the other. You put some grain into the, st into the stones, you turn them and it grinds it into meal. Now, meal is the roughly ground flour. You put it through a sieve, and when you shake it, you get a white flour coming from it. Can I have a go? Yes, right, you try. It's hard work, but you have to go the other way around, sorry. What is this machine used for? Well, this is the same as the hand quern, only larger. Now, the hand quern is quite hard to turn. This will be turned by a windmill or a watermill. The stones, there you see them inside, very large. The grain, that is the wheat, is put in a box at the top. It runs down a chute into the stones and then comes out around the edge, just like the hand quern. The millstones themselves were about 4 feet or 1.2 metres in diameter and weighed about half a tonne. They had grooves cut into them to direct the grain from the centre of the stones to its outside edge. In 1864, the Lord of the Manor, Earl Spencer, proposed that the common should be enclosed and a new manor house built for himself near the windmill. The millers had to move out with most of their machinery. A legal battle against Lord Spencer's proposals ensued, resulting in an Act of Parliament in 1871 preserving the Commons as public open space. The windmill was no longer working, but it had not been demolished and it was now converted into living accommodation. The building was divided internally to create accommodation for six families. Brickwork replaced the first floor timber walls and a complete outer skin of stock-facing brick was added to both floors. New windows and new chimney stacks were added, and the timber tower on the roof was rebuilt and used to accommodate water storage tanks. One of these rooms has been preserved on the first floor to show what the living accommodation would have looked like in Victorian times. There were no bathrooms. Cooking and boiling water was carried out using the open fire. 
The windmill continued to provide living accommodation on both floors until 1975, with the last occupants being common staff. Parts of the ground floor were also used by the National Rifle Association, who held competitions on the common in the 1860s and 70s. In 1975, the building was vacated for essential repairs. Many timbers were replaced and retained timbers were treated. Asphalt replaced the zinc roof and the zinc-covered tower was repaired and clad with timber. New foundations and some load-bearing walls were added. By 1976, the work had been completed, but it was now difficult to see how it could be used for any practical purpose. It was suggested that it could be used as a museum to give some idea of how the building would have looked when it was a working mill. With working parts from other windmills loaned by a local mills enthusiast and other items obtained from members of the Mills Group of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, a museum was created on the first floor, with the ground floor refurbished as staff accommodation. The main entrance was now to provide access to the living accommodation on the ground floor, with the entrance to the museum being through a side door and a staircase leading to the centre of the first floor. Collections were built up, illustrations prepared and models built. In 1998, the ground floor became part of the museum. The whole museum was redesigned and an application was made for a heritage lottery grant based on an estimated cost of £100,000. The entrance would now be through the front door and the best use was made of the spaces available. In this part of the museum, we have a number of models showing different types of windmill and the way they developed. The first one here is one of the earliest mills in this country, a post mill from the 16th century. It contained a single pair of millstones and the miller had to turn the building around to face into the wind whenever the wind changed. These are models of other rather unusual windmills. This one near Brighton had barns attached to it. This one, which uh, is supposed to work whichever way the wind is blowing, but wasn't very efficient. The central area shows some of the original machinery. The main shaft and great spur wheel are reproductions, but the bearing carrying the base of the shaft was found buried under the floor. The rooms on the ground floor were converted for housing the tool collection, the growing collection of model windmills and a room for talks and video presentations. In this room we had models of industrial windmills, but they were later replaced by a large model of a wind turbine, which is the same scale as all the other models. The stairs also had to be altered in order to avoid blocking the exit but they lead to the first floor. The museum is run entirely by volunteers who give their time to helping visitors and explaining unusual features. They also provide physical help for some of the exhibits, which enable visitors to try their hands at grinding flour using the saddle stone, pestle and mortar and the hand quern, as well as explaining the use of millstones and other exhibits. The tower of the mill is not part of the museum, but many visitors like to look up through the trap door to see the upper part of the mill. The windmill occupies a special place in the heart of the community in Wimbledon. For many, its spectacular appearance and its idyllic rural setting make it as much of a representation of Wimbledon as the acclaimed tennis championship. As a true community asset, the windmill is the focus of a wide range of activities in addition to its core function as a museum of windmills. There are a number of family days when visitors can make paper windmills or watch baking demonstrations in the forecourt. The Scouts have a special connection to the windmill, as Lord Baden-Powell wrote part of his Scouting for Boys while staying at the Mill House. They hold several events on the common, using the mill as their base. Our annual carols concert, led by the festive notes provided by the Wandle Concert Band, has become a prominent feature of Wimbledon's community scene, attracting hundreds of visitors. In 2018, 
the windmill was the setting for a centenary World War I remembrance event.